so dear and respected friends thank you so much for joining us today's swadhyay sat chakra dialogue we are going to start today's session with an invocation of a song written by tagore thank you dear and respected friend thank you so much for your kind attention i randhir kumar gautam on behalf of raffles university swadhyay sat chakra family and bishwanidan center for asian blossoming i welcome you to the webinar on the very topic holistic pragmatism in the post truth sincerity normativity and humanism it is a great pleasure and indeed an honor to have available to us distinguished speaker professor semi philistron from university of hensley i welcome you sir thank you so much for accepting our invitation i welcome professor anand kumar giri from madras development institute chennai and honorary trustee of his vinidan center for asian blossom i would like to extend a very warm welcome to our chief patron honorable dr justice meena v gomber former chief justice of rajasthan high court professor divakar gori vice chancellor of raffles university and all the respected participant viewer listener both on facebook platform and youtube or zoom platform let me give a brief introduction to our honorable speaker professor semi philistron uh, he is a professor of philosophy of religion and a deep philosopher his main research interest in philosophy includes the pragmatist tradition the problem of realism in various areas of philosophy the philosophy of religion transcendental philosophy ethics metaphysics as well as meta philosophical issues currently he is actively involved in the academy of finland center of excellence region and religious recognition led by professor restro uh, sarwin hosted by the uh faculty of theology uh, in which he is one of the three team leaders in charge of research group focusing on contemporary philosophy of religion his other uh, academic responsibilities include among other uh, like uh, he is a chair of academy of finland research counseling research council of research and society uh, chairing the philosophical society of finland is uh, having very diverse and deep uh, engagement with many philosophical issues uh, thank you so much sir uh, let me give a brief introduction to our swadhyay sat chakra circle for self and mutual studies swadhyay sat chakra is an initiative of studying and learning together self culture societies and the world friends associated with this are eager to walk and mediate with new horizons of thinking and new movements of social and cultural change at work in our contemporary world we study seekers such as sri arvindo mahatma gandhi chitranjan das a creative seeker and creative thinker from odisha and many others from around the world we also present our own writings and reflect upon our creativity together we also invite seekers from different fields of life to share us with their lives vision sadhana and struggles for creating a world of beauty dignity and dialogue we meet every sunday or sometimes on wednesday now we are nurturing this dialogue in collaboration with the school of humanities and social science today is a very special uh, topic as well as very very catching topic we got uh, uh, more than 100 participants from different part of the world the and respected friend pragmatism uh, been a constant and dominant force uh, in the philosophy from nearly 100 years and it has made a significant contributions uh, area ranging from logic epistemology philosophy uh, uh, philosophy of language uh, legal philosophy uh, philosophy of science ethics aesthetics so and so forth according to pragmatism our uh, theories should be judged by their practical values rather than uh, their accuracy in uh, rep representing the world 
the ultimate fate of this idea was neatly put by a great american philosophical uh, uh, figure sandy uh, morgan this who said uh, it was pragmatism was all very uh, well in theory but didn't work in practice during initial period pragmatist focus significantly on theorizing inquiry uh, meaning uh, uh, and the nature of truth, although uh, William James put these themes uh, in the work of exploring of truth uh, in religion, a second uh, generation turned uh, pragmatist uh, philosophy more explicitly towards politics, education, uh, and other dimension of social improvement and so social empowerment, uh, uh, you know, uh, under the influence of uh, John Dewey and his um, friend uh, Jane Adams, you know, uh, she got Nobel Prize, Nobel Peace Prize in uh, 1931. But when we understand uh, uh, this beautiful philosophy in today's uh, world, particularly in the age of post-truth, as someone defined this age uh, as the political subordination of reality. Now it's a very contentious question where uh, post-truth comes, but uh, but I think uh, there are several roots. Uh, the main um, is from uh, the science denial. Uh, the understanding, you know, uh, this uh, understanding will be very contentious, contested. Uh, therefore, it needs to be discussed in terms of sincerity, normativity, and humanism. So, with this brief introduction uh, and observation, now I would like to invite Professor Anand Kumar Grisa to kindly moderate today's session. Thank you so much, uh, dear and respected friends. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, Lord and clear. Okay, so it is a joy and enrichment for us to have Professor Sami Philstrom with us this afternoon and this morning. So I have had the enrichment of knowing the work of Professor Sami Fistrom and reading his work a little bit. And last time we met was in the World Philosophy Congress in Beijing. And um, we also have been in communication. He very kindly had a look at the book I edited, Pragmatism, Spirituality and Society, and had shared a few thoughts. Now, today we would be gifted some of his thoughts in the very important book that he has recently penned, Pragmatist Truth in the Post-Truth Age, Sincerity, Normativity and Humanism. It's a very important work because very rarely philosophers take a stance which is up to the point of front. For example, the way in the name of post-truth politicians like the, the then president of USA, Donald Trump is using the rhetoric of post-truth and the danger it poses. So Professor Philstrom as a philosopher, he is very candid about some of these challenges. At the same time, he challenges us to also relate to the challenge of truth in a way, how truth emerges in the way we relate to practice. It is related to our belief. At the same time, not all our belief, we can just uh, legitimize it or we can just announce our belief as the only truth. Therefore, in his book, he has a very important chapter on agnosticism. And, and therefore, he's saying that even we believe this is a very important argument or a very invitation that he's telling us that how we have to believe, will to believe is very important. We believe 
but while believing we also cultivate what can be called as creative critical and pregnant agnosticism because uh, sami is very thoughtfully relating to hana arend and and uh, uh, he is bringing the notion of natality that as human beings of course we are born but with our practice we can be born and born again and that way our pragmatic practice which is a quest for truth with all challenges and at the same time it is nurtured by a will to believe a will to believe which at the same time accompanied by a sense of critical and transformative agnosticism and uh, and then such kind of modality of engagement gives rise to give birth to our own self in a new way as we are immersed in practice and of course this chapter also relates relates to suffering so agnosticism pragmatism and suffering but this modality of pragmatism also contains seeds of overcoming suffering so this kind of pragmatism what building on morton white uh, sami calls as holistic pragmatism it is very significant and the way we can realize holistic pragmatism uh, you know with and beyond the terms of discourse that sami is uh, engaging in this book for example we can look at this holistic pragmatism as an ecological pragmatism in the sense that that the way you know we are located and not only holistic pragmatism conclude includes sincerity normativity and humanism but also the ecological context where we are and uh, it also includes our consciousness you know so this kind of holistic pragmatism so it has a possibility to be read and cultivated what i wish to submit as integral pragmatism that means a sense of wholeness also is attentive to the integral dimension of our practice truth and the challenges and this integral pragmatism also looks at practice but also transcendence now the concluding engagement of um, you know sami is with what he calls as transcendental humanism and this he builds on uh, william james and he says that how james pathway of pragmatism for example as we read uh, charles sanders peers and then uh, john dewey which is much more transactional naturalism in uh, william james we find transcendental humanism that is also deeply significant because today the crisis of truth that we face this crisis is a call for us to renew our engagement with truth in ever sincere ways and here um, we can also remember gandhi you know gandhi gandhi's engagement with truth experiments with truth and these are the kind of border crossing conversations uh, that sami's books call for and gandhi says that even non violence again this whole when we come to suffering and with hana aren the challenge of violence then the one of the challenge with us is that how do we embrace or how do we confront the challenge of violence and non violence and uh, in a way when john dewey says when we talks about the cooperative search for truth so when truth 
we search in a cooperative manner even in the post truth age in the so called post truth age if there were possibilities for such a cooperative dialogue even agonistic you know i would like to bring agnostic and agonistic together yes now it is not just that uh, the battle and you know that we all uh, you know throw bottles <laughs> in the battle as uh, president trump was doing a bit but even if we have bottles and in our battles but how our field of agony you know agonistic field as um, some scholars of democracy are talking about agonistic democracy so agnostic the 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 path of agnosticism and here we can also invite uh, paul tillich who says in his book on faith that let us have faith but faith which is also skeptical so i was thinking about some of these related thoughts as i am you know going making my journey with this very important book of sami so we are very eagerly looking forward to be enriched by you and my another thought very quickly is that this holistic pragmatism also has a poetry and so the poetic dimension of uh, transcendental humanism and holistic pragmatism so when the pragmatic become poetic and the poetic becomes pragmatic so with some of these initial submission so with great joy i welcome you dear and respected sami and let me try my little finish <laughs> kitos <laughs> All right, thank you so much for your kind words, both of you, Randir and Ananta, and, and thank you for this kind invitation to, to this session. I'm, I'm very pleased to, to be visiting this, <coughs> this group and, and this seminar. Um, so um, how, how long would you expect me to speak? Like maybe half an hour or, or 45 minutes, and then we'll have some time for a discussion, right? Yes, yes. Yes, okay. No, I, okay. So, uh, yes, uh, I, I will, uh, I will share a PowerPoint slide. Some, yes, uh, yes, you can see it. You can see yes, it. okay. I, I'll do that. I'll first uh, show this new book uh, to you. It's here. This is the one that Ananta kindly asked me to talk about. It's just an ordinary book recently out from Cambridge University Press uh, called Pragmatist Truth in, in, in the Post-Truth Age. And uh, as, <clears throat> as was already mentioned, uh, there are a number of uh, themes that are in a way integrated in, in the book. So, so uh, obviously, I can't really explore all of them in in this in this talk, but uh, but as Ananta already or already mentioned, there is this this idea of of developing a certain kind of holistic pragmatism, uh, holistic in the sense that it, it it sort of includes the epistemic evaluation of our beliefs and, and conceptions uh, together with with the ethical or maybe existential perhaps including religious for those those who are uh, inclined to uh, toward religious uh, ways of thinking so 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 all of, all of that in in a way integrated in, into a, into a holistic assessment of our of our practices so even though the book uh, has the 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 word truth in its title it's not a, a technical examination of the concept of truth in in the sense in which uh, most philosophers uh, coming from the analytic tradition would expect so so in that sense it, it it may also be a disappointment for some readers it's it's definitely not a theoretical uh, or it's not a new theory of uh, of truth in in any sense nor is it strictly speaking any any sort of new historical interpretation of 
the classical pragmatists such as William James's views on truth. Uh, it does begin from James in a way and, and, and tries to, to say something about the later developments of the pragmatist tradition, including Richard Rorty. I, I will talk about Rorty in a moment a little bit. And, and also, also this, uh, this idea of holistic pragmatism that, that, that was, uh, as Ananta mentioned, developed by Martin White in particular. And, and then there are some of these uh, twists and turns in, in the argument. There, there is a chapter on, 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 on James's will to believe argument, and, and there is something on, on agnosticism, a kind of a, uh, a self-critical way of thinking about our, our, in a way, entitlement to, to, to the concept of truth and, and, and so on. Uh, so there are there are many things there. I'm not sure if they if they all even coherently <laughs> hang, hang together, but I I, I tried to say something about uh, issues and ideas that I that I think are somehow related. Uh, but of course, I mean, you know, my my attempt to do so is probably flawed in in many ways. But uh, but uh, uh, I'm I'm truly grateful that you're interested in in these in these thoughts about truth and pragmatism. So, so with this uh, very, very brief summary of, of what, the, what the book is, is aiming at, maybe I will uh, share with you a PowerPoint presentation which uh, summarizes some of the ideas in the first chapter of the book in particular. And, and that is the chapter that is most explicitly related to this post-truth issue. Uh, so, so um, let me see. Uh, maybe this works. Can you can you see my slides now? Yes, sir. It is visible. Okay. Good. And uh, maybe I will. I will. Uh, if I switch to the presentation mode or the slideshow mode, it's you can you can still see it, and you can see it changing, I suppose. Yes. Yes. No, it's okay. Not. Good. So uh, I gave this, this uh, brief presentation, this kind of title, uh, James Rorty Trump O'Brien. Of course, O'Brien refers to the famous fictional character in George Orwell's novel 1984. And, and so, so we'll, we'll consider how, how pragmatism and the pragmatist conception of truth is related to, to this, this sort of uh, fragmentation of the, of the very concept of truth that we may, we may uh, see around us in, in, in our so-called post-truth age. So this is, uh, we, we may talk about the rise of uh, post-factualism and post-truth ways of thinking, uh, often associated with political populism of, of of various kinds and and uh this this phenomenon has sometimes been traced back to for example postmodernism or postmodern relativism or constructivism ideas that are in a way related to to this uh, to this uh view that that we don't really share a common objective world there is no such objective world out there it's just that we have these different perspectives often related to political power structures or, or, or traditions that don't really communicate with each other and, and so on. And there is no sort of higher court of appeal uh, from which we could uh, judge who, who is right and, and, and so on. Uh, of course, we can't uh, explore, and the book certainly does not explore this phenomenon in, in all its cultural or, or even philosophical dimensions it's a, it's a complex phenomenon and, and and there have been several contributions uh, also also book book length one, once uh, published over the past few years on, on this post truth phenomenon and, and I'm not really trying to analyze that as a cultural phenomenon or a political issue uh, what I do try to consider is whether pragmatism has had some role to play in this in this unfortunate development toward what we may call post-truth and and perhaps more precisely what kind of pragmatism may have had such a role to play uh, in in um, 
it, it might be worth pointing out that there is there is of course this sort of larger philosophical question concerning realism at the background here at least at the background if not at the very center of, of this discussion the the question concerning uh, to what extent there is a an objectively real world out there independently of, of our human uh, ways of conceptualizing it or or uh, theorizing about it or or or, or, or having beliefs about it. Uh, and as, as you know, this realism debate uh, may take different forms across the different disciplines within philosophy. Uh, there is, of course, uh, an in intense discussion going on concerning scientific realism in its various forms, uh, whether science is able to, to track truth in, in some sense and, 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 and uh, lead us to new truths about the way the world really is independently of us. There, there is uh, the question of realism concerning ethics and, and, and moral theory. There, there is uh, the realism issue concerning uh, the philosophy of religion as well. Uh, and and uh, so whether, whether religious uh, ways of using language, for example, are able to employ the notion of truth uh, in some objective sense, whether religious expressions refer to or even purport to refer to uh, a world out there that is independent of language and so on. So, so there are a number of dimensions of this realism debate. Again, this is a vast philosophical topic that, that I, 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 I can barely even touch in, in, in a single book. Perhaps the important thing is that the notion of truth is, is essential to the realism issue, no matter what, what, what you're interested in more specifically regarding realism and, and its alternatives in, in the philosophical discussion. And, and philosophers who, who may disagree on, on, on the various forms of realism, uh, there are, may, may also uh, fully agree about the relevance of the concept of truth. Also, when they disagree about what truth is or what the concept of truth means, uh, they would still, at the meta level, so to speak, agree about the significance of, of uh, the concept of truth for understanding the realism issue. So, so this is just like, a, like an introductory uh, remark about the whole sort of you know, philosophical area in, in which we're moving here. Now, uh, let me show you a picture. There's a familiar face there. Uh, this is the text here is, is in Finnish. Uh, uh, this is of course a picture of uh, the former American president at a time when he was not yet president. As you can see, he's, he's here. Uh, advertising his his book called how to get rich <laughs> and and uh, now the context I, I will ex explain uh, why I'm I'm showing you this particular picture this this text is, is from a from a Finnish uh, philosophy textbook uh, uh, I was involved in a in a team uh, writing a, a textbook for high school students uh, like an introduction to philosophy in, in Finnish this this particular book from from which this picture is is uh, taken came out in 2005 and and uh, I I have no idea who who suggested that we might use this this picture of Donald Trump Back in 2005, I certainly had no idea who Donald Trump is. I, I had never heard of this guy before. And, and of course, he was a media figure in, in the United States. But in, in my small home country, Finland, he was not a, a well-known person. He, he was only, only people who would, would follow American media more closely would have, would have known Trump. But somebody got this idea that, that there is this, this guy with this bestseller, How to Get Rich, and we might 
introduced the pragmatist conception of truth by, by using this, this uh, uh, funny image. Uh, so so the, the Finnish uh, question here uh, in, the, in the text uh, uh, is as follows. Uh, according to a kind of naive interpretation of the pragmatist conception of truth, uh, truth is to be identified with some kind of usefulness. Uh, uh, true beliefs uh, work in one's life. They are useful for the person holding them. So if, if you get rich by following the, the, uh, the kind of instructions you, you get by reading Donald Trump's book, How to Get Rich, if you actually do get rich by, by reading the book, does that mean, according to the pragmatist theory of truth, that uh, what is said in the book is true? Or perhaps applied to, to the case of Trump himself, if, if he becomes rich or richer by writing the book, does that mean that, that its statements are true in the pragmatist sense? And of course, the, the, the obvious answer uh, we would expect our, our reader to come up with is, is that no, the, this, does, this does not make the book true. Uh, actually, this was the context in which we, we placed this photograph of, of Trump. Here on the, uh, on the previous page of the same textbook, uh, we, we, we placed a, a picture of a, of a Soviet citizen in, in the former Soviet Union reading uh, the newspaper Pravda. Pravda uh, in Russian means truth. And that was, of course, the, 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 uh, the official ideological uh, propaganda of, of, the, uh, uh, of the Soviet uh, Communist Party. So, um, so we, we thought maybe these, these two pictures of, of, of fragmentations or destructions of, 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 of the very concept of truth could create a kind of dialogue here and, and also, also in a way uh, critically problematizing the, uh, the, the pragmatist understanding of truth. So, so this was the context of, of this, uh, <clears throat> this picture of Trump introducing the pragmatist theory of, of truth. And, and uh, of course, at that point, nobody would have imagined that we would have someone like Trump become president. Well, that is fortunate, of course, his presidency is, is at the moment at least over. But, uh, uh, but certainly we do have this, this uh, phenomenon of post-truth uh, all around us. Uh, we know the, the kind of, uh, kind of uh, for example, protests against uh, COVID vaccines, for example, uh, and all, all, the, all the disinformation campaigns in the social media against COVID restrictions and, 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 and vaccination programs that are extremely uh, harmful to our societies and, 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 and are fatal uh, to many people, uh, causing uh, innumerable lives to be lost uh, as the pandemic continues. So certainly the phenomenon of post-truth is, is extremely serious and, and the fact that there are leading politicians, including Trump, but also many others in, in other countries that are like uh, spreading this post-truth post-factualist discourse around and, and, and giving a model to, to, to many other political actors in the world, uh, both in the global context and, and in, in more local ones. That is certainly an extremely serious phenomenon. So uh, we could also introduce the concept of naive or perhaps vulgar pragmatism here and, and, and make a distinction between such, such a vulgar pragmatism and, and more sophisticated, like philosophically serious versions of pragmatism, when we try to uh, determine what exactly should be meant by a, a, a pragmatist conception of truth. Uh, <clears throat> there is actually a paper titled Vulgar Pragmatism by Susan Hawke, uh, a well-known pragmatism scholar and an analytic philosopher uh, back from the mid-90s, mid and, and it, it uh, contrasts Richard Rorty's pragmatism with Hawke's favorite 
version of pragmatism, which is which is the more Persian one, based on the work of Charles Sanders Peirce, the founder of pragmatism. So um, uh, I suppose one sort of obvious observation here is that there are different ways in which the concept of truth can be fragmented. Uh, there is uh, this extremely vulgar pragmatism represented by Trump, where truth is basically what is useful to, to you or to him or, or to me. And, and truth is in a way reduced to, to such immediate uh, subjective usefulness. From Trump's point of view, I suppose, uh, uh, the relevant distinction would not be between what is true or false, objectively speaking, independently of his, uh, his own concerns, political or economic or, or, or other concerns. The, the only, only relevant question would be whether uh, uh, something is useful for him or not. Uh, but then another kind of fragmentation would take place in, in the kind of totalitarianism that the other photo that I showed you with, with the Pravda newspaper from the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, there, there, uh, the, the, the political power would be so, uh, so strong and so authoritarian that, that it, it would be able to, to uh, suffocate all, all rival attempts to, 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 uh, <clears throat> to pronounce truths. Uh, now, I suppose uh, most of us are familiar with George Orwell's dystopic novel 1984, which, which is uh, centrally about the truth and, and, and what is happening or what might happen in some extreme circumstances to the concept of truth. Uh, whether uh, a brutal political <clears throat> power could make us believe uh, that two plus two equals five instead of four. Uh, Richard Rorty has, has an interesting essay on, on Orwell and, and this novel where, where he uh, <clears throat> writes, uh, this is maybe one of the best known one-liners by Rorty. Uh, he says, if you take care of freedom, truth can take care of itself. And, and uh, <clears throat> we'll get back, back to this, but uh, Certainly, the notions of truth and freedom are, are uh, fundamentally related in, in our societies and, and, and in our lives. And, 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 and a pragmatist investigating the ways in which the concept of truth functions in, in human practices and, and, and what it means to be committed to, to, to employing that concept and, and, and to, to, uh, to, uh, to pursuing the truth. Uh, in, in various uh, areas of human life, certainly has to take seriously this, this link between freedom and truth. We might wonder, however, whether it's really the case, as Worthy says, that if, if we take care of freedom, then, then we don't really have to worry about truth. But what I think we, we need a critical self-reflection of, of, of pragmatism. Uh, and and uh, perhaps also I mean, I've been in a way defending pragmatism at, uh, at a general level, at least uh, in, in basically all, all my work up to now. And, 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 uh, and I also think we, we, we need to sort of maybe have some second thoughts about what kind of pragmatism is to be recommended in, in this situation where, where there is this real threat of, of a uh, loss of, of objective truth. Okay, so... Um, let, let us take a look at what, what the, perhaps the most famous uh, pragmatist truth uh, uh, theorist uh, says, William James. Uh, in, in his well-known book, Pragmatism, 1907, James states the following. I'll, I'll read this quotation. Uh, to you, this is one of one of the. There are many many quotations there that will be relevant, but let us take a look at this. Uh, a couple of ones that I I, I chose uh, for for this discussion. He, he says this: truth independent, truth that we find merely truth, no longer malleable to human need, truth incorrigible. In a word, such truth exists indeed superabundantly, or is supposed to exist by rationalistically minded thinkers, but then. It means only the dead heart of the living tree. And it's being there means only that truth also has its paleontology and its prescription. 
and may grow stiff with years of veteran service and petrified in men's re regard by sheer antiquity. But how plastic even the oldest truths nevertheless really are has been vividly shown in our day by the transformation of logical and mathematical ideas, a transformation which seems even to be invading physics. So he, he seems to be saying that, yes, in some sense, there is this sort of objective realistic truth, that uh, truth about the way the world is independently of us. But that's in a way only only the, the sort of dead heart of the living tree, as, as he uh, metaphorically puts it. And, 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 and insofar as the concept of truth is, is, is of any relevance to us uh, in, in our practices of, of thought and inquiry, including science, including, uh, including maybe ethics, including religion, including whatever, uh, then truth has to be seen as plastic or, 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 or um, in, in a way uh, uh, something that can be transformed. And, and then uh, there is this uh, perhaps more famous uh, uh, formulation. He, he, he continues by saying that truth is one species of good and not as is usually supposed a category distinct from good and coordinate with it. The true is the name of whatever proves itself to be good in the way of belief and good to for definite assignable reasons. Okay, so the immediate question we can ask then is whether the fact that uh, what Trump says uh, may, could make you rich, whether that is uh, a way of being good in the way of belief in, in the sense that that would render Trump's statements true in this pragmatic sense. And one more quotation from James's pragmatism. He, uh, he, he characterizes pragmatism as a, a philosophical approach that asks its usual question, grant an idea or belief to be true, what concrete difference will its being true make in anyone's actual life? How will the truth be realized? What experiences will be different from those which would obtain if the belief were false? What is the truth's cash value in experiential terms? And then, of course, this, this uh, way of using the, the metaphor of cash value created a bad reputation for pragmatism as, as some, some sort of philosophical articulation of, of American capitalism, basically. But um, <clears throat> But for James, this is just a metaphor. It's, it's, uh, it shouldn't be taken to refer to, to, to cash value in any literal sense, of course. Anyway, he continues, the moment pragmatism asks this question, it sees the answer. True ideas are those that we can assimilate, validate, corrob corroborate, and verify. False ideas are those that we cannot. That is the practical difference it makes to us to have true ideas. That therefore is the meaning of truth, for it is all that truth is known as. This thesis is what I have to defend. The truth of an idea is not a stagnant property inherent in it. Truth happens to an idea. It becomes true, is made true by events. Its verity is in fact an event, a process, and so on. Uh, so um, note, by the way, that uh, uh, that uh, if we look at this passage from William James, he's not actually asking uh, what concrete difference or what practical difference will our believing some idea or some, some conception to be true make in our lives. What he, what he asks or what he says the pragmatist asks is the question about what concrete difference that idea being true would make in, in our or anyone's lives. So, so he's, he's not a naive anti-realist who, who would simply reduce the, or subjectivist or relativist or whatever, who would simply be reducing this um, <clears throat> uh, notion of truth to, to the subjective satisfaction of our believing certain to be true. He is interested in, in experiential effects or practical relevance, but, but he's, He's in a way um, associating that that uh, that practical relevance uh, to 
the ideas being true as such, not, not just to our, our believing it to be true. So I think there is an important difference there and, and, and this, this must not be overlooked. Anyway, uh, when, when we move in the, in the pragmatist tradition, uh, now of course skipping many important figures, including people who have been mentioned already today, like John Dewey or Jane Addams, uh, if, if, we, if we take a look at a, a more recent pragmatist, Richard Rorty, uh, there is a sense in which Rorty starts from this Jamesian idea of the plasticity of truth and, and, and of truth being something that is, uh, that, that is related to or, or based on or, or, or can only be meaningfully discussed within our practices, uh, rather than being something that we, we, we could uh, uh, simply uh, uh, associate with our sort of attempt to represent an, an objective independent world as accurately as possible. Uh, now, one of, one of Rorty's most interesting and, and also most problematic uh, accounts or explorations of truth can be found in this essay by him on Orwell that I already mentioned, the last intellectual in Europe, Orwell on cruelty. Uh, and and uh, there Rorty argues against what may be taken to be the received view according to which Orwell's 1984 is a defense of realism and the objectivity of truth. Uh, Rorty attacks those realistic readings of Orwell that focus on the significance of objective truth. And as already mentioned, he emphasizes freedom in contrast to, to truth. And uh, so there are a couple of quotations from Rorty here uh, from, from that, uh, that essay. Uh, it's in his book, Contingency, Irony and Solidarity, 1989. <clears throat> so, so he says, I don't think there are any plain moral facts out there in the world nor any truths independent of language, nor any neutral ground on which to stand and argue that either torture or kindness are preferable to the other. So the world does not make anything like that to be the case. These are like uh, matters that concern our human practices and human ways of using language. And, and, and how this is related to Orwell, well, Orwell convinced us, according to Rorty, this is the second quotation here, that there was a perfectly good chance that the same developments which had made human equality technically possible might make endless slavery possible. He did so by convincing us that nothing in the nature of truth or man or history was going to block that scenario. And, and the figure of O'Brien, the, the party, torture in, in the novel is, is, is crucial here, of course. Uh, so, um, so, so Rorty seems to be saying that the, the philosophical point of, of Orwell's novel is not that it, it would somehow matter deeply whether it's true or false that, for example, two plus two equals four. Uh, rather, all that matters, and this is another quotation from Rorty's essay on Orwell, all that matters is that if you do believe it, that is, if you do believe that two plus two equals four, then you can say it without getting hurt. So you're free to say it, you're free to say what you believe. In other words, what matters is your ability to talk, talk to other people about what seems to you true, not what is in fact true. If we take care of freedom, truth can take care of itself. This is where this often uh, quoted slogan by Rorty comes from. Now, my worry here is, and I, I think the, <clears throat> the worry, the, this worry ought to be shared with anyone who wants to take like a, take a self-critical look at the pragmatist tradition. I wonder if this is really the case. And, and my worry is that this might actually lead to something like Trump. And if, if this in a way entails Trump or the fragmentation of truth, uh, we, we know from Trump. Can we even trace this back to, to William James? Uh, because it is to a large extent James's pragmatic view of truth that Rory starts from in, in, in his discussion. 
I mean, not in not not explicitly in the in the Orwell essay, but in, in his in his way of developing pragmatism generally. Or perhaps can we even trace this back to Kant, Immanuel Kant, who, who already criticized the assumptions of, of metaphysical realism, uh, according to which we, we would somehow be able to be cognitively in touch with, with the way as it is, the, the, the way the world is in itself. And so 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 the basic question is whether the pragmatist ought to be a stronger realist than pragmatists like James or Rorty have maintained. And, and uh, a lot here depends on what exactly it means to take care of freedom or to take care of, of truth. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and of course, we can't, we can't develop uh, this, this uh, theme at any length here, but, but uh, if I think of what I've, what I've tried to do in, in, uh, in the book, uh, is, is uh, to, to reflect on maybe not explicitly so much, but at least implicitly on 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 what it means or could mean to to take care of of truth, uh, in in the sense that, uh, that that truth is something that is associated with our practices of thought and inquiry. Also, also in areas like politics or religion, where it might not seem so obvious. As, as for example, it, it might in science that, that we are seeking the truth. So, so, so what, it, what it would mean to take care of truth in, in, in these more sort of existential uh, areas of human life. And, and, uh, and, and the, actually the, the issue of agnosticism that, that was uh, mentioned by, by Ananta earlier, uh, that, that is also related to this caring about truth and and, and uh, in a, in a way trying trying to 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 respect the notion of truth even when we're not certain how uh, how far it 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 it, it, uh, it really applies to our discourses or ways of using language and and, and uh, okay so this is a lo long story and, and and goes beyond this this presentation here but just uh, a link to the broader themes of the book perhaps. Okay, uh, some, some further remarks. Now, even when we move on from Rorty to this post-truth phenomenon associated with Trump and others, it looks like even, even someone like Trump cannot really avoid using these conceptual distinctions between truth and falsity or reality and, and some sort of unreality. So, because he, he seems to be saying things like, don't believe the f what, what he claims are the fake news. They are false. What, what you're, he, he's been quoted as saying, what, what you're seeing and what you're reading is not what's happening. So he, he seems to be appealing to something that is really there, something that is really happening or something that is really, really true uh, and, and, and is, is somehow misleadingly uh, represented in, in what he calls the fake news. Uh, now, of course, Trump was calculated to have lied thousands of times. I can't remember how many times during his presidency, but like an enormous number of, of times. But uh, but the point here is that uh, <clears throat> that the, that even even when lying, even even when deliberately blurring our understanding of, of how the distinction between truth and falsity functions in our lives and practices, he can't really get rid of that conceptual distinction himself. And, and, and if we think about uh, real life totalitarianisms, even, even the most extreme ones there have been, think about the Soviet Union, for example, uh, in some sense, although of course, the horrible communist system was disrespectful of, of, of the very notion of truth and, and tried to hide uh, truth uh, or what is true from, uh, from the people. Uh, this is a way of, of nevertheless acknowledging the, the significance of truth, precisely because truth had to be kept hidden in order to control people's thoughts. A, a much more uh, sort of uh, extreme uh, fragmentation of truth happens when, 
when the very notion itself is destroyed. And, and, and it, it, it could be argued that Orwell's novel experiments with this idea that there is a sense in which the very notion could, could disappear from our practices and, and language use. And perhaps the, the, the dangers in this current post-truth populism are such that, that they might, might actually come closer to this, this uh, destruction and fragmentation of truth, not just attempts to hide the truth from view or from people's uh, being able to find, find out what is true, but, but perhaps even more alarming, alarmingly uh, destroying the, uh, the very concept of truth. And, and of course, social media uh, is, is part of the part of the problem here in many ways, as, as we know. Now, uh, does, does Trump follow from Rorty in a way? We could argue that Rorty is, is wrong in the sense that freedom at least is, is not sufficient, at least not mere negative freedom. We, we need more than our being free to say what we think is true and not being heard. What is needed is some sort of positive freedom and responsibility, uh, which is of course related to, to, to various social and, and cultural and political issues concerning the practices of, of truth we are committed to. It is related to the political system, to the educational system, to, to our being able to, to take the kind of responsibility we, we should be able to take for our uh, truth claims. Uh, and I suppose, and, and again, this in a way uh, is, is a broader theme, uh, both uh, implicitly and, and to, to some extent explicitly present in, in, in my book, that this involves a kind of a sincere commitment to truth, which is not just a, an epistemic, but also an ethical and even existential matter. And, and, and the Jamesian will believe idea would come to the picture here as well. And, and uh, so if we talk merely in terms of, of what is called negative freedom, we can certainly say there is a lot of freedom in, in for example, American politics. But nevertheless, apparently truth has, has failed to be able to take care of itself as, as Rorty would have believed. So defending freedom in, in any sense that is richer than the most minimalist negative concept of freedom presupposes that we acknowledge the concept of truth, at least in some sense. But now I think this, and perhaps the, the philosophical point of this presentation and also the first chapter of the book uh, mainly is, is here, that in, in a broad sense of, of, of pragmatism, we might say that this is a debate on truth that is actually internal to, to our pragmatist engagement with, with uh, the issue of truth. Why and for which purposes do we actually need a realistic notion of objective truth? That is, that is the question. And I'm, I'm suggesting uh, uh, with some qualifications and, and reservations uh, that we might try to develop a kind of a pragmatic pluralism about the concept of truth in the sense that there can be at the meta level a plurality of context dependent truths about truth within a kind of a political discourse where we have to be able to somehow respond to, to, to people like Trump or, or Orwell's O'Brien. We need a fairly robust realism and, and an objective notion of truth, even, even the kind of correspondence theory of truth that philosophical realists typically defend. When we are dealing with academic philosophical issues concerning truth, um, <clears throat> We might uh, we might develop a, a view like William James's, and and these these may not uh, these these may not uh, necessarily run into conflict with with each other as long as we we take a kind of meta level pragmatist view according to which whatever we take to be true about truth itself is itself context dependent and 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 uh, must reflect our pragmatic purposes. Wittgenstein once said in, 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 in one of his lectures from the 1930s, I don't have the exact reference here, but I think I do have it in the book, that there may be something 
correct in all the classical theories of truth. So there is no need to choose between them, and, and none of them is, is, uh, is in a way the whole truth about truth. Among contemporary analytic philosophers, Michael Lynch, for example, has written a number of books on the concept of truth, also defending a kind of pluralism about truth, uh, although not explicitly in relation to pragmatism. So, uh, so what this yields is arguably a certain kind of pragmatic realism, a certain kind of pragmatic justification for realism and objective truth, even correspondence truth. And, and uh, in this political situation, with the kind of tensions we have, with, uh, with the kind of disinformation campaigns in the social media we have, uh, with people like Trump around us with the pandemic and, and all that, we should not too much emphasize the pragmatic plasticity of truth uh, along James's lines but rather its realistic and objective character. And, and uh, so I'm suggesting that the truth about truth is itself pragmatically context dependent. However, this is a way of applying the pragmatic conception of truth at the meta level. In a way, pragmatism here guides our choices among the multiple different concepts of truth that, that might, be, uh, might be defended at the first order level, so to speak. I guess, there is some, some way in which this comes relatively close to what Hilary Putnam, uh, at least at a certain point of his long philosophical development, uh, defended uh, as, as, uh, <clears throat> as some form of pragmatic realism, or as he called it, internal realism. But I'm not going to go in, into this in any, in any detail here. Uh, we might, of course, ask whether this leads to a, to a kind of vicious circle or, or begging the question in, in some sense. Um, can we say that the pragmatist theory of truth is itself only pragmatically true because it, it works at the meta level, guiding our, our uh, different context, uh, context embedded uh, ways of using the concept of truth? Uh, well, I, I think uh, if, 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 we, uh, if we philosophically subscribe to any theory of truth, we, <clears throat> we need to address this issue of self-applying the theory. This is arguably a problem for any theory of truth, not, not only pragmatism. For example, if, if, you're, if you say that truth is correspondence with reality or true statements or true beliefs correspond to the facts or correspond to the way the world is, does this mean that if that if you hold this correspondence theory of truth, then then uh, you must think that that theory actually is itself true in the sense of corresponding to the way things are concerning truth? Uh, so I don't think vicious circularity is is any more a threat in the case of pragmatism than it it might be in, in relation to any other true theory that that would also have to be self-applied to the extent that we can call any philosophical theories true. Uh, I, I want to mention one of the one of the best, I'm, in my view, one of the best critical discussions of Rorty's reading of Orwell at this point. There is this long essay by James Conant uh, on Rorty, on Orwell uh, from 2000. And, and, uh, and, and in a way, he's defending our uh, our entitlement to a kind of an ordinary concept of truth, which uh, which Rorty in a way blurs in, in, in insisting that that freedom is is uh, prior to truth. Uh, I think Conant has has many highly important points to make uh, here, and again we can't go into to any details, but but this debate could also be enriched by by what I have been recommending here as a kind of meta-level pragmatist emphasis on the, on the contextuality of the very concept of truth and the, and the need to consider such contexts in terms of, of whatever pragmatic value-laden, value-guided purposes we have. And I, I don't think this, this would, uh, in a way, bring Trump back or, or play in, in the hands of Trump, uh, because because there are notions such as 
responsibility uh, and also like critical self-reflection that are like irreducibly uh, employed here. Uh, we just can't escape the kind of continuous self-critical reflection on our practices of using the concept of truth. Uh, or the values and interests served by those practices. And, and I think emphasizing this would be in a way the heart of pragmatism uh, in the sense that I'm, I'm defending pragmatism here at all. Uh, and and, uh, and it, it might even be suggested that pragmatism is, is really the even, even the, the only conception of truth that can really take seriously and, and, and elaborate on this sort of self-reflection issue and, 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 and also, also accommodate this, this uh, ethical and political dimension of, of, of our sincerely being committed to the pursuit of truth uh, at, at various levels and, and with different practices. So <clears throat> I just have a couple of slides more, not, <clears throat> not more than two. So, and, and then we can, we can spend some time discussing these issues if you wish. So, so again, I, I think, uh, I think Rorty, I, I have been critical of, of what Rorty, Rorty says about truth and the way he employs pragmatist ideas in, in this discussion uh, inspired by Orwell. Uh, this does not mean that I would would think that already got it all wrong. I, I think he has has enormously important points to make, and and uh, for example, toward the end of the Orwell essay, he he reminds us that what our future rulers will be like, that is whether they will be like the the party or the Big Brother, in in Orwell's uh, novel, or whether they will be like some liberal democratic rulers, um, <clears throat> uh, that is. That, that will not be determined by any large necessary truths about human nature and its relation to truth and justice, but by a lot of small contingent facts. And I think any reasonable person can agree with Rorty about this. The historical contingency of the ways in which our societies, as well as our practices of, of pursuing the truth, uh, develop. Things could go wrong, and they could go very wrong. Uh, and and it's, it's at our own responsibility when uh, engaging in whatever practices we do engage in uh, to, to do our best uh, uh, to, to ensure they, they don't go seriously wrong. But uh, so we can, we can agree with Forty here. But again, this does not liberate us from the concept of truth. This, presupposes the concept of truth, uh, even if it's, if, if it's at the level of small contingent facts, as he said. And then uh, there is this uh, Rortian ironism. Uh, Rorty uh, uses, as you may know, this, this uh, concept of uh, final vocabularies, which is something that, uh, that he, or he means by this phrase, uh, the kind of ideas or ways of talking about things we find fundamental in the sense uh, that we can't really uh, defend them or justify them with reference to, to anything that we would take to be more, more fundamental or, or more important. Than, and so there would be like final vocabularies. And, and the, for example, for, for us in, in liberal democracies, we, we could, we could uh, regard fundamental human rights or human dignity, the kind of discourse on, 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 on human rights and human dignity to be a final vocabulary in, in this sense. And now Rorty says that we, we should learn to be ironic about our final vocabularies in the sense, not in the sense that we would fail to be or, or cease to be committed to them, but, but in the sense that we understand their historical contingency that they are a result of small contingent facts in, in history and, and not dictated to us from above, so to speak. Uh, so, so then he says, uh, again, this is in the same Orwell essay, if we are ironic enough about our final vocabularies and curious enough about everyone else's, 
We don't have to worry about whether we are in direct contact with moral reality or whether we're blinded by ideology or whether we're being relativistic or something like that. Well, this I think is a big if. It is precisely, oh sorry, there's a typo there. It is precisely for this reason that we can never be sure whether we are ironic enough or curious enough that we do have to worry. And I think we constantly have to worry, uh, perhaps not about being in direct contact with moral reality, but at least about the possibility of, of becoming blinded by some ideology that prevents us from genuinely self-critically uh, problematizing our own commitments and our, our ways of pursuing the truth. So, so this is in a way how these issues of sincerity and, 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 and personal or even existential commitment to, to, to self-critical pursuit of truth come, come into the picture. So um, this is my concluding slide. In this book, I'm, I'm presenting these sort of uh, self-critical reflections uh, by a pragmatist, as we might say, or, or, or pragmatist self-reflection, critical self-reflection. But that's, that, as I already pointed out, this does not mean that, that I would be recommending a, a move out of pragmatism or, or, or that I would recommend rejecting pragmatism or, or moving back to some form of metaphysical realism. Rather, I'm suggesting that, that we do have to take the concept of truth and, and realism and, and objective, even correspondence truth seriously within pragmatism itself. And, and, and we could say this is a modification of Kant's uh, basic idea that uh, our empirical realism about uh, the objective world is based on some form of transcendental, in Kant's case, it would be, this would be transcendental idealism, but analogously in, in, in this pragmatist setting, it's something like transcendental pragmatism. It is in terms of our value guided and, and value embedded practices requiring sincere commitment, including ethical commitment, that we, in a way approach whatever objective reality there is for us. And, and uh, I think this Kantian uh, point or this Kantian dimension of pragmatism is not available to, to radical pragmatists like Rorty who, 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 for whom pragmatism has no transcendental level of inquiry in this sense, but it, it could be available to more Kantian pragmatists. And this would be one way of developing pragmatism into this direction of uh, critical philosophy. So one of one of the uh, arguments in in my book is is that we we have to take seriously the Kantian background of pragmatism, so to speak. I didn't really have have a chance to go into that in in this presentation, but that is one of the one of the themes of the book. And and and, and there is also one chapter comparing. Kant's and James's uh, ideas in, in this regard, and, and, and also Kant's and James's conceptions of the human being. And, 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 and uh, so, so that's, uh, <clears throat> that's one, one of the twists and turns of, of the overall argument of the book. But I'm afraid I won't have time to go into that any, in, in any more detail. Here, at, at this point, I would like to very much thank you all for your uh, for your interest and and, and uh, maybe it's time for me to stop talking now and, and I will be happy to try to respond to any questions you might have. So thank you so much. Kitos. Kitos. <laughs> so you would learn a few more words and health and sound of Finland in a pragmatic mm. way. <laughs> so Thank you for your very important presentation. So, dear friend, let us join Sami in our conversation. So, to begin with, uh, let me invite uh, Gyan Luigi. Uh, Dr. Gyan Luigi Sarraba is a fellow philosopher based in Vienna. Gyan Luigi, please. Yes. Excuse me. I hope I am audible. Uh, yes, yes. I will. Thank you very much. 
it was really very interesting. I was here and was reflecting on the different points. And I must admit, I would I would need to 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 have much more time in order to reflect. Well, the first the first thing perhaps that uh, it comes to my mind is well, I have the impression that unfortunately I must say in the field of the politics we have to do with something as regards the the truth which is uh, always connected or very often connected to the position of the vulgar pragmatism if i have understood it well correctly because uh, well i think that there has uh, always been uh, in the politics and in for instance in the politics between states uh, i think for instance in this moment i don't know why but it came to my mind the the gulf of tonkin uh, resolution and the gulf of tonkin incident the uss maddox incident which led uh, in 1964 to uh, a growth of the american uh, development in the vietnam war and um, an increase of the american involvement in the weapon vietnam war which was probably uh, as it seems now in history in history books something which was nearly completely invented by the u.s american forces uh, military forces it is i think that in the field of politics many times uh, there is the ex there is the interest which makes the field so to speak for instance we want to increase our involvement our engagement in war and then there is uh, uh, the creation of facts uh, which are apt to uh, give the impression of a truth which justifies the interest which is concealed to the public. It is, I think that many times in the politics, the principle is we have this interest and the truth which will, will be correspondingly uh, fabricated, made. And it functions, there is, it works. Therefore, uh, let's go, let's go ahead. Uh, I do not know whether this 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 position could be always uh, synthesized as vulgar pragmatism, but I think that the principle is the interest is here, here is our politics, and we can fabricate uh, facts, uh, fakes, uh, better better to say that facts. So we fabricate facts which confirm the goodness of our interest and if it works it works indeed if it works it is true if it does not work with the public with the public opinion then it is not true um, i think th this is the first thing which i would like to, to say the second thing yeah too i would need much much time in order to reflect is uh, it regards the correlation which we could have between truth and good that is true true and truth as a name of whatever proves to be good uh, in the way of belief uh, as it is said uh, i understand it but i wonder whether there is the problem that in whichever constellation in which we say uh, truth and good do we not have the problem to define what good is because uh, you know i think we can have and a society can have different conceptions of good different interpretations of what good and goodness consist in and correspondingly if we put a correlation or a connection between truth and good, uh, then 
corresponding it to the different interpretation of good, we have uh, different interpretations of good. That is, I see, I, I do not understand here the, the completely the point of the of the position which says to is the name of whatever proves to be good in the way of belief and good for defining assignable reasons because I see and I I can understand the, the point that I think there is the problem that good uh, should in this sense nearly uh, be established as something with which uh, which we can commonly define and can easily define, but good proves to be a, a difficult concept to be defined and proves to be a concept which has different interpretation as regards to, depending on the cultures and on the time. Well, this, there are many, many points, but I would like to give space to the other interventions. Thank you very much. It was wonderful, really wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for these, <clears throat> these questions and comments. Uh, you're really raising fundamental issues and I'm, I'm uh, obviously there, uh, there won't be any, any sort of adequate response to, to, to these concerns. Uh, I, I share your worries that, that in politics we may almost inevitably have to deal with some, some sort of vulgar pragmatism, but even even many many of those politicians who, who we might regard as as uh, serious and, and respectable and 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 like uh, being on on the good side so to speak even even many of them might might have to make all kinds of compromises with the concept of truth uh, given given the way politics is in in, in real life and, and real societies nowadays conducted it's 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 all, almost impossible to, to be committed to a kind of disinterested pursuit of truth for the sake of truth itself. Uh, if, if you have to deal with, with the enormously complex political issues and, and political reality we are uh, we're living in. Uh, at one point in, in the book, I briefly referred to Hannah Arendt's article truth and politics from 1967 uh, i mean i'm not an Arendt scholar scholar uh, i make some some uh, like tentative proposals to 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 compare Arendt and, and william james uh, in terms of this idea of natality for example that was mentioned in the beginning but also perhaps perhaps this this issue of truth uh, might be a relevant comparison there. And Richard Bernstein is actually one of the relatively few philosophers who, who has written on both Arendt and, and the pragmatists. So, so Bernstein's work is certainly worth looking at here. But, but in, 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 this, uh, in this essay, uh, Truth and Politics, Arendt examines this kind of, which you also, I think, referred to, to this kind of antagonism between political action and truthfulness and 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 also also discussing deliberate lying as as a political force and 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 i suppose at least some of her observations are even more relevant today than they they were in the 60s uh, but uh but but she also also says that while while truth itself is somehow powerless that's the word word she uses it's also irreplaceable in, in the sense that it cannot be really replaced by political force or, or violence or anything like that. Uh, but, but, but we, in a way, we need to, to be able, I think Arendt is saying that we need to, 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 to be able to somehow take a kind of critical distance to, to the political reality in, in order to, 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 to appreciate the significance of of truth in, in politics. Uh, I have a very brief quote here. She says, to look upon politics from the perspective of truth means to take one stand outside the political realm uh, from the standpoint of the truth teller. Uh, in a way, 
appreciating something like a disinterested pursuit of truth. And of course, this is something that becomes a problem then if we, if we, if we try to understand the concept of truth from a pragmatist point of view, because in a way, the very point of a pragmatist a kind of truth is that there is always this interest relativity there, and there is no such thing as a, as a disinterested pursuit of truth uh, in some strong sense, that there would be no human interests involved at all. That's some sort of an illusion, but, 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 but it's being an illusion should not lead us to, to a full-blown relativism according to which there is no cr critical way of comparing the interests we might have and, and, and the ways we, we employ them in, in our uh, ways of speaking about what is true. Uh, rather, our interests themselves ought to be a, a topic for con constant critical inquiry and, 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 and this, is, this is the way in which the, also these ideas concerning critical self-reflection and, and reflexivity come into this, this picture. But certainly I, I don't have any and, and I, I don't think any, any serious philosophical pragmatist can really have any immediate or obvious answer to this worry about truth and politics. I think it's a worry we constantly have to have to deal with and, and, and take extremely seriously. And, and also, I guess this is to, to a certain extent, this is related to this, this uh, issue concerning how to define what is good if, if we define truth or if we maybe not define, but maybe loosely characterize the concept of truth in James's way in terms of what is good in the way of belief. What exactly do we mean by it? By, by good or, or uh, what kind of what kind of interest relativity is there? Certain, certainly, uh, James, as a kind of philosophical pluralist and individualist, would not be happy with any any totalizing, overarching definition of, of good. He, he would insist uh, on this 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 kind of. Uh, uh, individual uh, plurality in, in our different ways of, of, of conceiving the good and 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 uh, and, uh, and and so uh, actually also this is one one reason why why I think it is important maybe the, this is this does not come up in this particular book as much as in some some other work that I've tried to do I, I think it's it is important to to connect this pragmatist engagement with with truth and and inquiry uh, also also with kind of neg negative issues negative experiences such as evil and suffering not just good but also also the the kind of uh, very opposite uh, and I think James's James's pragmatism is very strongly about the problem of evil also when it comes to the philosophy of religion that's a slightly different story that, that's not that's not the main theme of this, this book. There is something in the final chapter on this problem of suffering to the extent that is, it is related to the sort of caring for truth and agnosticism that is discussed in that chapter. But, but I've tried to do some work on that, that topic in some earlier publications. But this is not really an answer to your, to your question about defining the good. Certainly, I don't have any definition to give or, or any, again, any obvious answer. These are just some some reflections that come to my mind thank you thank you sami now we might have a few friends who would share some thoughts and if it is all right we'll request you to kindly take a note of and then we'll have more time for a mutual conversation so it is in that spirit now let me invite uh, professor mira chakraborty please Randeep, Professor Mira Chakravarti is there? No, no she is not there. Okay. Then Minati, Saji. please. Dr. Saji is there. Okay. So, Saji and then Minati, please. Thank you, Professor. Professor Swami, thank you. Thank you very much for elaborate discussion on pragmatism. 
Now, you have referred to William James and John Dewey. Thank you very much for referring to Rorty as well. Somewhere you have also quoted William James from his book on pragmatism, where he relates that the truth happens to a proposition and the happening is through an event. I am concerned about these events the events or the incidents which enable one to realize the truth or the falsity of a proposition. Can these events be objective or is it that these pragmatists talk on such methods, taking themselves to idealist, idealist concerns or certain level of subjectivity itself. Or in other words, can these methods be differ? Can it differ from person to person? In that sense, is it that the theory of pragmatism drawing itself closer to idealism itself, somewhere to Berkeley, Berkeley's kind of theory of subjectivity, subjective idealism, rather than being objective. That is one concern that I have with regards to these methods of arriving at truth. Um, rather than being very objective, it looks like as though it could differ the person. Are we arriving at a kind of idealistic perspective relating to truth itself with regards to the methods. Another is, uh, sir, about, uh, is it really that the facts are going beyond the language or is it just getting confined to the way we use language? Uh, in that sense, we are coming closer to Noam Chomsky today in contemporary age, or even Charles Taylor who talk about language. Are we really going beyond the level of language to understand facts? Uh, are facts getting tied to the language in which we are using? You refer to also Immanuel Kant, a thinker that I am uh, in fact very deeply associated with, associated in the sense I read Immanuel Kant very often. Now, is he also not talking about contextualizing in terms of morality? The universals are getting concept contextualized. These universals, according to him, in ethics or in morality, the moral universals needs to be contextualized. So I don't think we are going beyond a certain level of contextualizing in morality. This is another. And you had mentioned somewhere that you had also written a book on introduction to philosophy for your students. I also teach philosophy. I would like to know how you introduce philosophy to the young students at least in your book, how have you introduced these concepts or abstractions to the young scholar? Thank you very much. Thank you, Saji. And Sami, I request you to kindly you know, take note of a few other meditations if they come. So now, other friends willing to speak? Minati and other friends. Dr. Professor Usa, uh, Ms. Neera Chakravarti, Madam, is there. So, okay, yes. please. Yes. I see, Professor. Yes. Uh, who is the? Yeah, Randi, so who is the speaker wanting to speak? 
मीरा प्रोफेसर मीरा चक्रवर्ती या या थैंक यू ओके थैंक यू रणधीर थैंक यू अनंता प्रोफेसर फील स्ट्रांग इट्स आह इफ यू यू मेंशन द ट्रूथ हैज द हैज टू बी आईडेंटिफाइड विथ सम काइंड ऑफ यूजफुलनेस दैट्स व्हाट यू मेंशन एज यू सेड now may i know why is it i mean that that the the racially divided world uh, in which the people who are white and people who are non whites live together the non whites uh, live in the broken world facing very bravely while the non fragile white community members they even share their don't even share their bravery Now, how would and when would the white world, while arguing about truth, would share the uh, uh, this consciousness? Why is why when will the truth deal with the divided consciousness? Thank you. Thank you, Randi. Yes. Thank uh, you, Aniti Pradhan. Thank you, Mila. And other friends wish wishing to speak. now maybe yourself randeep uh, yes sir uh, actually uh, you know with the advent of this post modernism and all i think truth can only be understood in context of morality the sphere of morality and politics in particularly uh, apt for uh, pragmat uh, pragmatisms Uh, non foundationalism because there is no foundation on certainty grounding any our beliefs so it's no, no surprise that uh, there is no foundation or certainty grounding our ethical or uh, political belief pragmatism actually gives us a kind of chance of making sense of how we can be right or wrong in moral and political matter that's a huge um, advance uh, on 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 most other theories of truth for that those who take uh, truth uh, to be a correspondence between mind independent objects and our uh, world make it impossible to think of truth in morals and politics and those who take there is no truth anywhere make it impossible to think of truth in morals and politics uh, so i have a kind of um, saying that uh, you know there is uh, truth to be bad and because it isn't correspond with mind and independent object perhaps it it's to be um, bad in morals and politics as well as uh, in science so thank you so much thank you so much sir for giving very very excellent uh, you know, presentation professor shams thank you randeep and to this festivity of thinking uh, i wish to add a few uh, thank you sami now you have engaged yourself with the ethical and the political aspect of the pragmatism from james and you say how it is not just epistemic but also in this context now the ethical but also the aesthetic dimension and the ontological dimension so how it is in james and and then this aesthetic dimension and the ontological dimension of pragmatism for example pragmatic search for truth how we can relate to other contemporary pathways uh, for example in gyanivati mo you know who 
you know, in a way builds, you know, engages a bit with pragmatism in his own way. And, uh, you know, he talks about weak ontology. And uh, maybe this pragmatic way of truth, you know, should it be accompanied by a weak ontology? And what might be a possible dialogue between Rotti's non-foundationalism, rather Rotti's anti-foundationalism, I think we can, uh, the challenge is not so much anti-foundationalism, but a kind of a non-foundationalism. And I think Rotti maybe is stressing too much on anti-foundationalism in a self-confident way. But we need to think of ways of relationship between weak ontology of Jnani Bhatimo and the non-foundational dimension of pragmatism. And then the issue of pluralism is very interesting. You know, the pragmatics and the plural that you have uh, explored. But I just wish to say that building on William James himself, especially his plural universe, uh, Professor Fred Dalmayer, a deep seeker of our times, he has written a very important work called Integral Pluralism. So my submission is, that this holistic pragmatism and integral pluralism. Now, is there a difference between pluralism of any kind and integral pluralism? And at this point, there is possibility for what can be called as cross-cultural conversations. Now, Rotti talks about, Richard Rotti talks about conversations, but these conversations can be uh, you know, in, in your sense that the conversations also need to be open to self-criticism. And my submission is that once we bring cross-cultural conversations or trans-civilizational conversations, then pluralism can be realized by very interesting pathways. For example, in Africa, there is a very important way of thinking called Ubuntu and uh, you know which is a dimension of the plural you know and then in india we have a very interesting pathway called anekanta building on jaina tradition and the great philosopher jn mohanty who builds on edmund husserl and gandhi he and, and the jaina tradition he develops a path of thinking called multi-valued logic so my submission is that this pluralism also can be linked to this kind of thoughts, you know, building on pluralism as it has been cultivated in the pragmatist tradition, but also opening it into border crossing conversations. Contingency, you have referred to Rotti's uh, book, Contingency, Irony and Solidarity. These contingent facts, now these contingent facts do, do, do they have also some transcendental dimensions uh, and, and, uh, and the relationship between contingency and transcendence? Normativity, you know, maybe because of the paucity of time, we could not hear more about your engagement of normativity and, and how normativity, you know, a little more on that. And finally, about uh, poetry, because Rotti, you know, his pragmatism when he's saying that it is, we are, we, we speak. And, the, you know, you are critical about that. Uh, but at the same time, the, your some uh, way is that how we can speak sincerely, for example. And therefore we converse, we converse sincerely. I think this is a very sincere conversation. It's very interesting. Therefore, rhetoric, rhetoric is not just any kind of thing that we say, that even our rhetoric has a dimension of sincerity. And speaking about truth and politics, and this political rhetoric, when it becomes sincere, and, and the history of politics you know, is not devoid of that. And, and Miraji was referring to divided consciousness. And as pragmatism has a home in America, I think, uh, you know, Charles Pierce just came after American Civil War. And, and then when uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, his Gettysburg speech, 
you know, and, and this was a, a, a speech, you know, which was trying to touch people and address the divisions and which constituted a nation in a different way. So therefore we would have to think about political rhetoric in a way, you know, with all our challenges that how the whole dimension of sincerity can again be, you know, interwoven, can be cultivated in the space of uh, conversations and political rhetoric. So now I uh, request uh, Sami to kindly share your thoughts. Excuse me, uh, Professor, uh, one of our discussant has raised Dr. Devant Kumar Tiwari. Uh, you know, yes, just okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for giving me the opportunity to uh, hear something uh, at this platform. And I'm thankful to Professor Sami for uh, his benign uh, presence and brilliant presentation on pragmatism, particularly when uh, Professor Sami uh, referred George Orwell 1984. Uh, definitely, uh, that is based on totalitarian philosophy, control, total control by government, total control by the ruler means uh, that concept of thought police, that concept of big brother, means whatever is uh, will be done by the people of the society, it will be under surveillance. So definitely that too uh, uh, was inspired by kind of practice, ongoing practice uh, in uh, Russia or different part of the world. So uh, uh, my submission is ki, uh, you know, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Sami uh, also pointed out and Professor Anand Giri was also saying that, that pluralism in literature, uh, that is polyphony, means your concept, your ideology may be right. But apart from you, there is another part of world existing. They have their own concept. They have their own rights. They have their own philosophy. So definitely there is a parallel world not parallel multi multi world which is which exists they have their own truth and definitely if uh, and uh, that, that particular line uh, uh, when quoted by professor sami of royalty if you take care of freedom truth can take care of itself and particularly if i would like to quote uh, king martin luther junior uh, particularly when he uh, goes ahead to support uh, the black people or colored people, they, they say ki as uh, for sake of saying you have given us freedom, but we have been bifurcated, we have been discriminated. So uh, your world means your beliefs are different, but we do we also exist. So uh, whatsoever uh, is your ideology or philosophy, but you live and let us also live. There should be a kind of uh, common treatment. There should be a, a kind of equal treatment, not for sake of saying, but for uh, uh, accepting it, giving the equal rights. So that uh, statement by Professor Sami, that if you take care of freedom, freedom should be given, should, freedom should be protected. If we are free, any society is free, definitely uh, it will, uh, automatically protects the truth, respective truth. I must say, respective truth. There can be truth of different people, different sects, different ideologies. Say, for example, in India, there are the people who worship Rama, but at the same time, there are worshipper of Ra Ramana as well. So, let us protect freedom. Truth will automatically. Truth has the power to protect itself. So thank you so much. This has been little thank observation you. from my side. Thank you so much, thank sir. You. Thank you, Dr. Tiwari. Now, uh, Professor Sami. Okay, thank you very much for all these comments and, and you're all raising uh, fundamental issues that, that obviously I can only very briefly comment on here. We, we don't have much more than five minutes for this session, right? So, so, so I'll try to be very brief and 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 
that means I, I will uh, I, my, my, my responses to, to, to your questions and, and comments are inevitably inadequate and, and, and only only tentative. So, um, so, so Sami, we used to request, if possible, you can kindly take 10 minutes, you know, if it is okay, okay. in case yeah. you need, so that we are enriched okay. by your... <laughs> so so we'll, we'll go a little bit over over time. That's, that's fine, it, yeah, as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, yes, first there, there was this uh, issue of idealism raised by Saji, I, I think. I, in, in the beginning and, and uh, uh, the question about uh, whether James's views on, on truth happening to an idea leads to some form of idealism, maybe even the kind of subjective idealism we uh, or typically attributed to, to George Barclay, according to which the world depends on, on our subjective perceptions and, and, and so on. Uh, that is one one sort of uh, rather extreme uh, result that might might follow from at least a certain way of interpreting pragmatism or some of James's pronouncements. James himself is often unclear, and and he has this sort of literary style, with, which is in a way, of course, very nice to read. But but then when when you try to figure out what exactly he means. It's always it's it's not always as as clear as as uh, as as we might wish. There is certainly this element of of uh, like individualism there that that might might uh, might seem to go too far to some sort of subjectivism. In, in fact, James actually discusses Barclay as as one of the historical precursors of of pragmatism. So he has this interesting relationship to the not only to Barclay but also the other British empiricists actually one of my doctoral students here in Finland is, is writing a thesis on this relation between classical pragmatism including James and the British empiricists Locke, Barclay and Hume and I think that's a that's a fairly interesting historical topic uh, I think if there is a form of idealism in pragmatism it is however perhaps a uh, closer to Kant's transcendental idealism, although James himself was not at all a, a fan of Kant. I mean, James wanted to avoid being stuck with this uh, Kantian transcendental vocabulary, but, uh, but there is a certain analogy between the way in which the world is in a way constituted, constituted by the, the structure of, 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 of human cognition uh, according to Kant, and, and uh, it's being in a way constituted by the structure of, of human practices of inquiry and, and conceptualization, according to the pragmatists. So I'm, I'm willing to develop this analogy between pragmatism and Kantian transcendental idealism, perhaps more than, than pragmatism and Barclay and subjective idealism. Uh, then the, there was this question about how this um, question by Mera uh, about this. Um, Pragmatism is the kind of truth and usefulness in, in a world which is racially divided and, and, and a kind of a broken world. And, and, and this is an extremely important and, and, and uh, unfortunately always timely issue uh, uh, that we have to live in, in such a world where there have been and, and, and continue to be enormous uh, in, injustices based on racial discrimination. That's, uh, uh, I, I don't know what, what, what to say about, about that, that really, except that, that uh, in, in the philosophical tradition of pragmatism, there are some philosophical and, 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 and uh, scholarly resources for trying to approach uh, race issues and, 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 and criticize racism. Uh, uh, also from a pragmatist point of view. Uh, if we think of, for example, Cornel West's uh, ways of, of employing pragmatism in, 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 in his work, uh, also as a public intellectual, in, 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 of course, in an American context. Uh, so so there, there could be all kinds of, all, all kinds of new attempts to also, also utilize the pragmatist tradition uh, also, the the work of Jane Adams, for example, and 
and with, with some extension, W.E.B. Dubois and, and, and others uh, in, in, in this area. Uh, and then uh, there was uh, this, uh, this issue about uh, truth uh, in morals and, and politics uh, raised by Randir. Ye yes, I, I very much agree about there being no certainty available, a kind of pragmatic fallibilism associated with critical pluralism and, 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 and the way that the, the way of thinking that, that uh, comes all the way from, from Percy's original formulation of fallibilism, uh, and, and which, which is highly relevant also, also in, in the field of, of political philosophy and, 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 uh, and, and ethics. Uh, maybe the important pragmatist message here is that ethics and politics are indeed a realm of truth as well. And, and we just can't say that they would be something subjective or, or, or just subordinated to, to some random contingent subjective interests and power, power, power concerns or anything like that. But, but they are also uh, an area where critical inquiry is needed in the spirit of fallibilism. And 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 uh, lacking final certainty. So sorry, these are really just very brief reflections on on, on the on the enormously complicated issues that were raised. And then then Ananta uh, was also uh, also talking about the ethical and political aspects of pragmatism, but then extending this discussion to aesthetics and and ontology, and that is. That is obviously extremely important as well. Uh, I, I certainly don't think of pragmatism as, as a philosophical orientation that would somehow be, uh, or, or, or would, would or even could, uh, could avoid ontological issues concerning the way the world is. The way the world is is, is, is something that may not be uh, completely independent of our practical interests, but, but, but still we are dealing with this, this fun, fundamental, fundamental ontological questions about, about what there is and, 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 uh, and uh, what the world is like. This could very well be, be connected with uh, Vattimo's weak ontology, and, and there has been some exchange between Vattimo and Rorty, that's, that's all extremely important. And also, I, I very much sympathize with this, this idea of, of uh, uh, cross-cultural conversation and integral pluralism that were also raised by by Ananta and, and and there is more for philosophers in the pragmatist tradition to do in this regard. Pragmatism as a philosophical tradition is of course primarily American. It, it was in a way, as you know, initiated in the United States, but it has its European roots and European background going back to the well, the British empiricists were already mentioned, and and, and, and Kantian idealism as well. But uh, it can, it can, and must uh, definitely be developed in, in the global world today much more widely than 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 it, it has been so far in in this uh, Euro-American context. And uh, yeah, and and then the, there was this idea of polyphony invoked by Devendra. And, and I, uh, I think that is also something that, that we should, we should uh, see as deeply connected with this idea of cross-cultural conversation and, and, and the kind of pluralism that goes together with that. And, 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 and uh, these, these are all issues and, and ideas that go to the very heart of pragmatism, especially I think Jamesian pragmatism, because the, the notion of pluralism is so important there. And, and uh, oh yes, and then there was also this, this idea of poetry uh, or philosophy as some form of poetry uh, mentioned by Ananta, which is something that Rorty has written on. And, and while I was critical of Rorty's way of developing pragmatism to a certain degree, this does not mean that I would be opposed to his idea of, of, of also finding a kind of poetic element in, in philosophy. In fact, William James himself uh, often quotes poetry and, and has also been in a way used and, and, and developed by, by poets, even, even leading American poets like Wallace Stevens. 
there is some scholarly work available on the ways in which James has influenced uh, some important uh, 20th century poets. So, so that is also, also uh, worth uh, exploring. But uh, yeah, sorry for the brevity and, and inconclusiveness of, of these, uh, these responses. Uh, thank you so much for all these thoughts and, and, and all, all, all the points that you raised. I have to think about them carefully. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kitos. Kitos. Kitos now. No. Digital Kitos. 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 It was such a pleasure to participate in this. So, now it's we... time to formal vote of thanks. We are very, very in light. So, uh, Professor, Professor Dr. Tiwari. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please, please give formal vote of thanks. Thank you so much thanks. for uh, asking me to uh, extend the vote of thanks uh, at this August moment. And really, uh, I have been uh, listening uh, the uh, today's dialogue from the very uh, first uh, statement by Professor Sani, and uh, it was full of uh, so many enlightening thoughts and so many uh, ideas, uh, practical ideas, full fully quoted with philosophical, social and uh, sir uh, quoted uh, literature as well as time and again so sir uh, uh, we are very much thankful to you for accepting the invitation and gracing uh, uh, this uh, occasion by your benign presence and, and brilliant presentation we are thankful to professor sami feel strong for being the distinguished speaker of today's session thank you so much sir uh, I would like to express my deep felt gratitude to Professor Anand Giri sir for moderating the session and sailing the boat of this core learning so smoothly uh, whenever it requires sir acts as a bridge wherever there is a gap. So sir, thank you so much for uh, moderating the session and guiding us. I would like to express my deep felt gratitude to uh, our active co-learner, Professor Gyan Luigi, uh, for his uh, very consistent uh, atten uh, attendance as well as raising very relevant issues. So my thanks uh, to Professor Gyan Luigi. I would like to express my deep felt gratitude to Professor Saji, as usual, very grave, very up to uh, uh, the point and uh, very relevant. So uh, thank you so much, sir. My uh, thanks are due to Professor uh, Meera Chakravarti, ma'am. As usual, uh, ma'am presented very relevant uh, issue, very relevant question and observation. Thank you so much, ma'am. My uh, thanks are due to all the organizing uh, committee members, participants, co-learners from India and all over the world, and particularly organizing societies, uh, Raffles University, Vishwindam Center for Asian Blasphemy, and Raise Global Foundation, under ages of which continuously this series of talk is being organized and we are benefited. So thank you so much, uh, th these bodies. And now last but not the least, Professor Randhir Gautam, as usual, uh, the planner, executor, and uh, doing everything at his end to make such kind of events uh, successful. So Professor Randhir Gautam, thanks a lot. Finally, my thanks to everybody and uh, my good wishes. Uh, good night. Thank you so much. Thank you all again. Very, very Thank much. You. See you on some other occasion, hopefully, in the future. Yes, see you.